Good morning, everyone. Good morning. <laughs> a little surprise this morning outside. Um, I thought we might be done with this, but it uh, doesn't look like it. Um, Sue's going to come up with some um, announcements, but I'll just briefly announce quickly that um, you may have seen coming in, we have offering envelopes. Um, so if you didn't grab those on the way in, they're right by the door going out on the welcome desk out there. Um, I guess I could just share just quickly. I was at the Eco Faith Summit, um, the annual summit that um, the Northeast Synod has, and now we're paired up with the St. Paul Synod as well. So um, that was a good day. There was it was a relatively full church. It was at Gloria Day um, in Duluth here, um, and I got to eat lunch with uh, our former pastor Greg Garmer. So that was kind of a a fun surprise for me. Um, let's see, and then just a reminder on that note that it's Earth Day coming up next Saturday, April 22nd, so I encourage you to think about some things that you can do to um, be a caretaker of creation. Um, I think that's all I have, um, but Sue's got some announcements. Okay, hi, good morning. Oh, good morning. Uh, dovetailing on Earth Day, so that is April 22nd, this Saturday. And uh, as you know, we have kindred paths out there in our uh, forest. And Lane and Zach, uh, the founders, directors, teachers of kindred paths, they're going to be out there this coming Saturday doing maple syruping. So they wanted to invite everybody, uh, anybody that wants to come and learn about that and see that process and maybe get a taste. Um, they'll be there from 2 to 5 on Saturday. And then you might get to meet some of the families that have kids that attend the Kindred Paths Nature School here, too. So there's that. And then also, I'm up in arms this morning. I have two arm announcements. Uh, one is Jackie Eubanks. Uh, she's going to be doing our blood pressure screenings. She'd like to get a team started. And if you don't know Jackie, she's going to be lecturing later. So you'll see her, those of you uh, watching at home. And so just contact Jackie or myself if you are interested in taking blood pressures, if you're able to do that service. 
um, we'll get a schedule going or it might be just whenever you're here and you could do it. We have a blood pressure cuff in the office and a stethoscope, so there is equipment. And um, maybe we'll have them done before and after service to see if the blood pressure rises. I don't know, <laughs> you know, you could get it twice in one day. My other arm announcement is we are having a blood drive coming up April 26th from noon to six, and it's through American Red Cross. And last time I checked, we only had about five openings left. So if you're unable to give, what you can do is tell people about it so we can get that filled. Um, there are some stats that American Red Cross had on their, their site. Every two seconds, someone in America needs blood, which I just kind of blew my mind. Um, blood donation, a blood donation can help save up to three lives. 80% uh, of blood donations are collected at blood drives hosted by organizations like ours. And blood collected by the Red Cross helps patients in over 2,400 hospitals across the country. So the Red Cross, they send the, the blood we collect here. It doesn't always stay here, it goes out. Like I've given before and then I get a note uh, maybe a couple months later saying, your blood helped someone in Pennsylvania. And I was like, oh, cool, you know. They don't tell me who, but just where it went. So I thought that was really neat. So it takes about an hour if you do no donate, sometimes less. Um, it's a real easy thing to do if you're able. And like I said, if you can't, tell somebody about it. So that's a great service. So that's all I have. Those are my up in arms announcements. <laughs> Thanks, Sue. Uh, and I probably should have announced, but you probably figured it out that Pastor Kim's not here today, but um, she's been on vacation, I think Florida, if I'm not mistaken. So she's, I'm not sure what day she's back or if she's already back, but um, hopefully she's not <laughs> experiencing too much shock this morning if they are back. Um, so she'll be back uh, next week. Um, and I should also say welcome to those who are joining us online today. So. Hope you're doing well out there. We'll begin uh, our worship service. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Our gathering hymn is Now the Green Blade Rises, number 379 in the Red Book. <laughs>
Today we're thinking about our baptisms and um, later on in this next piece there is a bold print section for you to join me. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, the one God, by whose hand we are given new birth, by whose speaking we are given new life. Amen. Joined to Christ in the waters of baptism, we are welcomed, restored, and supported as citizens of the new creation. Let us give thanks for the gift of baptism. Holy God, holy and merci merciful, holy and mighty, you are the river of life. You are the everlasting wellspring. In mercy and might, you have freed us from death and raised us with Jesus, the firstborn of the dead. In baptismal waters, our old life is washed away, and in them we are born anew. Glory to you for oceans and lakes, for rivers and streams. Honor to you for waters that wash us clean. Quench our thirst and nurture both crops and creatures. Praise to you for the life-giving water of baptism, the outpouring of the spirit of the new creation. Wash away our sin, all that separates us from you. Empower our witness to give your resurrection. Strengthen our resolve in seeking justice for all. Satisfy the world's need through this living water. Where drought dries the earth, bring refreshment. Where despair prevails, grant hope. Where chaos reigns, bring peace. We ask this through Christ, who with you and the Holy Spirit reigns forever. Amen. Amen. Almighty and eternal God, the strength of those who believe and the hope of those who doubt, may we who have not seen have faith in you and receive the fullness of Christ's blessing, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. We continue with the first reading. The first reading is from Acts 2, a reading from Acts. Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. You that are Israelites, listen to what I have to say. Jesus of Nazareth, 
a man attested to your God by with deeds of power and wonders and sight that God did through him. Among you, as you yourselves know, this man handed over to you, accordingly to the definite plan and the foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed him by the hands of those outside the law. But God raised him up, having freed him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for him to be held in its power. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand, so that I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. Moreover, my flesh will live in hope, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One experience corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make full of gladness with your presence. Fellow Israelites, I may say to you confidently of your ancestors David, that he both died and was buried, and in his tomb is what with us to, do to this day. Since he was a prophet, he knew that God had sworn with an oath to him, and he would put one of his descendants on his throne. For seeing that David spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, saying, he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh experience corruption or decay. This Jesus God raised up, and that all of us are, are a witness. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. The second reading, one second here. The Psalms, this is the Psalms, okay. Um, it's a little bit different in this here. Um, <clears throat> the Psalms is um, from Psalm 16. And if the women of the congregation can read the regular print and will let the gentlemen of the church read the bold print. Protect me, O God, for I take refuge in you. I have said to the Lord, you are my Lord, my good above all other. run out of the gods shall have their troubles multiplied. I will not pour out drink offerings to such gods, never take their name upon my lips. O Lord, you are my portion of my cup. It is you who will hold my lot. My boundaries enclose a pleasant land. Indeed, I have a rich inheritance. Bless the Lord who gives me counsel. My heart teaches me night after night. My heart, therefore, is glad, and my spirit rejoices. My body also shall rest in hope. For you will not abandon me to the grave, nor let the Holy One see the dead. You will show me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy, and in your right hand are pleasures forevermore. do the prayer of the people. No, Don't not uh, okay. The second reading is from Peter. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ by his great mercy. He has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus has or through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who are being protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this for you, rejoice, even if now for a little, 
while you have had to suffer various trials, so that the genuineness of your faith, being more precious than gold, that through perishable is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Although you have not seen him, you love him, and even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and you rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy for you are receiving the outcome of your faith, the salvation of our souls. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Holy Gospel according to John 20, verses 19 to 31. The risen Lord appears to his disciples, offering them a benediction, a commission, and the gift of the Holy Spirit. But one of their number is missing, and his unbelief prompts another visit from the Lord. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed him them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord, but he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails, and my hands in his side, I will not believe. A week later his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not, not seen and yet come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Today's Gospel message is probably a familiar passage. Uh, it is the probably familiar passage of Jesus' specific interaction with the disciple Thomas of Doubting Thomas fame in response to Thomas's statement that he would believe in Jesus' return to life unless he not only saw him, but touched him. This is the most that is written about Thomas in the Bible. The only words from Thomas in the Bible are found in John's Gospel. We really don't know that much about him from Scripture. No words from him are recorded until late in Jesus' ministry when Jesus makes his decision to go to Judea to visit the family of, of, family of Lazarus who had died. At that time, Thomas responded to that idea by his willingness to accompany Jesus there, though Thomas knew it would be very dangerous for them all. Thomas said to the other disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Those sound like some very loyal and courageous words by Thomas. The second time we hear from Thomas is uh, another single sentence response to Jesus' statement that he was going to be leaving them and that they know the way the, to the place where he will be going. Thomas responded with some bewilderment, showing that though he spent lots of time with Jesus, he was still confused about what all was happening, saying, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? This statement of Thomas uh, led to the famous statement of Jesus, I am the way and the truth and the life. No other words except for today's reading are recorded from Thomas in scripture. 
Thomas doesn't seem to be remembered for any of this loyalty or courage. Instead, Thomas has received a lot of flack for being a doubter. However, was he really asking for more than Jesus had determined he needed to do for all of his close followers following his resurrection? On the morning of his early, on the er, morning uh, of his resurrection early, he first appeared to Mary of Magdala in the garden of the tomb. She reported her sighting to Peter and the other disciples, but they were pretty skeptical themselves, having not yet seen for themselves. In Luke, it said that the disciples reacted to the uh, women by um, thinking that the women's words seemed to them like nonsense. Sounds pretty similar to Thomas. Then they experienced their own sighting as Jesus came into a hiding place where at least a number of the disciples had gathered. They rejoiced at seeing Jesus according to the text. However, at least Thomas and perhaps some of the other disciples were not present at this first appearance. Jesus actually appeared to the disciples a number of times. Uh, the opening verses of the book of Acts state that after his suffering, he showed himself to the disciples and gave them many convincing proofs that he was alive. It says that Jesus appeared to them on occasion over a period of 40 days, in fact. So perhaps we shouldn't be so critical of Thomas for needing to see. But as we saw, Thomas was not present when Jesus first appeared. Where was Thomas? Why was he not also with the gathered group of disciples? The text does not say. Perhaps he was particularly disillusioned at Jesus' death and at what seemed like a failure of his movement and was not even interested in gathering with the other disciples. Maybe he had completely given up on this Jesus following and wasn't afraid like the other disciples were said to be because he didn't intend to continue to have anything to do with Jesus and would tell anyone threatening uh, him that. Then again, he states his willingness to die with Jesus in those previous words we looked at, and so maybe he just didn't have as much fear as the others did and did not feel a need to hide. We don't know why he wasn't in attendance, but by not being with the others, he missed out on this first astounding time Jesus met them. Perhaps this is a lesson to us that we may also be missing out when we do not gather in community with other followers of Jesus. Whatever the cause of Thomas's absence, he was present with the others the second time Jesus appeared to them. The text said that the disciples had found Thomas and had told him about Jesus appearing to them. Perhaps this contact and message by the other disciples awakened just enough hope and faith in Thomas that he went back to gathering with the disciples. And that choice paid dividends for Thomas. Jesus made another appearance with Thomas present this time. We are told that Jesus made a special point to interact specifically with Thomas. He took notice that Thomas had been missing that first time, and he knew that Thomas had said he, what he needed to restore his faith. And Jesus provided this to him personally, but again, while he had chosen to be present with the others. Thomas's response to seeing Jesus was seemingly stronger than the other disciples was. Certainly, they were not indifferent to seeing Jesus. It, the text definitely said that they rejoiced uh, when they saw their friend and leader back with them. Thomas' response to seeing Jesus seemed so quick that perhaps he didn't even need to take Jesus' offer to touch him, as Thomas told the others he must do to believe. The text does not say that, Jesus, or that Thomas touched Jesus. But more importantly, Thomas made quite a theological statement in seeing Jesus, confessing Jesus as Lord and God, and specifically his own Lord. I would suspect that, just, that this made Jesus smile. Jesus' next words could be perhaps be read as somewhat chastising to Thomas, as Jesus said, blessed are those who believe without seeing. But I'm not sure that's the correct reading of his words. Perhaps instead, he was stating to the disciples that there would be new believers who would come from the mission Jesus was now preparing for them, and he was assuring them that they would have success in growing the number of followers of Jesus. 
even though he would not be physically with them and they would not be able to physically, uh, he would not be able to physically show himself to those future believers. Indeed, th this is what Peter describes in our second lesson, that those new converts he was writing to had believed without seeing. It sure seems that Peter is directly recalling the statement that Jesus had made at that second appearance to the disciples about people believing without physically seeing. Thomas shows up a final time in John's gospel at yet another appearance of Jesus. He is listed as one of the other six disciples who were out fishing with Peter when Jesus shouted to them from the beach about casting their net to, the, to a certain side of the boat in order to make a catch of fish. Thus, Thomas again was given confirmation of Jesus' presence and another commission of the participation of, uh, in Jesus' ministry of fishing for new followers. The final time Thomas is mentioned in scripture is in the early part of the book of Acts. He is listed as being present, gathered with the other disciples, along with a number of women followers, Jesus' mother, and Jesus' brothers. Clearly, Thomas had determined that he wanted and needed to be together with the other close followers of Jesus and not be missing like that first time Jesus visited. This passage has much more going on in it too than only the Thomas-Jesus interaction. Thomas is a microcosm of the broader themes of this passage. The mission of Jesus to bring the kingdom of God to humanity was entering a new phase with his resurrection and his soon to be leaving in the ascension. He was gonna be handing off the mission to those close disciples and followers and thus he had to prepare them for this monumental effort. The first thing he needed to dispel in them was fear. The mission could not continue if the disciples were gonna stay holed up in fear of what others might do to them. He needed and wanted them to be at peace, even during turmoil. Peace is part of the experiencing of Jesus' kingdom. And that was his greeting to them multiple times in today's passage. He then specifically commissioned them that he was sending them out to continue God's mission that Jesus had begun. And importantly, he gave them the Holy Spirit who would empower them. The word about forgiveness at first seems kind of random here, at least it did to me. Uh, but perhaps the humanity of the disciples might be tempted to think about the harm that was done to Jesus as he showed them his scars and seeing him alive again lead them to think about revenge against those who killed him and that their leader had proven invincible. He returns to life after all, and so perhaps they um, ought to violently rise up against the Romans. Jesus reminded them that forgiveness and peace with others is a core facet in his kingdom and that, and that like Jesus did on the cross, they too needed to forgive Jesus' enemies in order to properly move forward with their mission. It was interesting for me to learn in preparing this message that Thomas took the gospel message a farther distance than any other disciple, all the way in fact to southern India. At this location, the current place name of Kerala, there are still Christians found there today, nearly 2,000 years later, who continue to hold a celebration uh, of St. Thomas on each July 3rd. There are actually a number of church traditions in that area that are descended from the original converts of Thomas there. The writings of those early Christians describe Thomas traveling even farther to China and later returning to India where he died as a martyr in AD 72. So Thomas kept that enthusiasm and conviction whereby he first responded upon seeing Jesus and traveled far with the gospel message. How can we see Jesus and increase our faith? At the end of the gospel lesson, John says that he wrote his gospel describing Jesus' actions and teachings so that we, who he knew would not be seeing Jesus firsthand in our lifetimes, could see Jesus and thus bolster our own belief. So it follows that our hearing of Jesus' teaching, uh, teachings as we attend worship services and as we read the scriptures ourselves or read other authors who write and teach about the scriptures is a good way for us to see Jesus. We also 
each have the voice of the Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts and minds, who Jesus first sent to the gathered disciples at his first appearance as they were hiding in the house. May we open ourselves to these opportunities to see Jesus and increase our belief and then participate in expanding the kingdom of God which Jesus came to establish. And the result of such belief is true life. Amen. The hymn of the day is number 370.
Please join me in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Please share the peace with your neighbors. prayers of the people, united in the hope and the joy of the resurrection, let us pray for the church, the world, and all in need. God of rebirth, the good news of your resurrection brings refreshment to a weary world. Following the woman at the tomb, empower us to boldly share your radical love through our words and our work. Hear us, O God. As you breathe your spirit into the disciples, breathe your spirit of healing upon all creation. Nourish the earth with sufficient rains. Strengthen us to counter the effects of pollution and destruction. Hear us, O oh God. You prepared the disciples for their ministry by calming their fears and granting them your peace. Equip our community leaders, especially. Give them a spirit of peace and hearts that burn for justice, that their leadership reflects your love. Hear us, O oh God. You come amongst us in unexpected ways. Send us to those who hide in fear or question your love. Be a healing presence for any isolated by addiction, incarceration, mental illness, chronic pain, sickness, or grief. Hear us, O oh God. As you met the disciples on the road to Emmaus, show us your presence along our journeys. Bless our doubts and questions. Provide trusting and safe relationships for all ages to nurture your connection to you and one another. Hear us, O oh God. Resurrect, resurrecting God, you bring us a new life every day. Thank you for blessing us with companions of our faith, our faith journey, especially those who now rest in, in your love. Strengthen us with the eternal peace of your promises. Hear us, O oh God. Rejoice in the victory of Christ's resurrection. We lift our prayers and our praise to you, almighty and eternal God through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. Amen. We continue with the offering. Uh, if you have offering with you today and missed getting it in the plate in the back, um, you can give it to one of the ushers and they'll make sure it gets in the plate with the rest of the offerings. Um, we pray, generous God, in this meal you offer your very self. We give thanks for these gifts of the earth. 
In the breaking of this bread, reveal to us the risen one. In the pouring of this wine, pour us out in service to the world, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, for the glorious resurrection of our Savior Jesus Christ, the true Paschal Lamb who gave himself to take away our sin who in dying has destroyed death and in rising has brought us to eternal life. And so with Mary Magdalene and Peter and all of the witnesses of the resurrection, with earth and sea and all their creatures, and with angels and archangels, cherubim and seraphim, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. <laughs> The night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom. Come and know Christ, broken and poured out for you. We will be serving communion on the floor here, uh, and the ushers will direct you.
Gracious God, in you we live and move and have our being. With your word and with this meal of grace, you have nourished our life together. Strengthen us to show your love and serve the world. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. The God of all who raised Jesus Christ from the dead bless you by the power of the Holy Spirit to live in the new creation. Amen. Amen. Our sending hymn is number 382 in the red hymnal. Go in peace, serve the risen one.
morning. 